All right, we are back at it. Welcome to another episode here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today, we are going to continue our vasopressor series, and we are going to be talking about phenylephrine. Um, we'll talk about what phenylephrine is, its mechanism of action, the receptors it works on, dosing, administration, pharmacokinetics, clinical uses, some evidence and studies on it, side effects, complications. We'll compare it to some other vasopressors as well. We'll do some kind of clinical and teaching pearls, and we will go from there. A friendly reminder, all of our study guides, this video included, um, or podcast if you're listening to in podcast form, is included on our Patreon page as well as practice questions. So definitely, definitely check those out if you have an interest. Uh, in addition to that, we have a free weekly newsletter that is primarily on public health and infectious disease. And then we have a podcast platform and YouTube uh, platform. So we'd love for you to join, check some things out, subscribe, follow along, all that good stuff. And then last friendly reminder, none of this is intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please stick around to the end of the video for the full disclaimer. No further ado, phenylephrine. What is phenylephrine? Well, phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1 adrenergic agonist. Let's dissect that a little bit. So pure alpha-1. So this only acts on alpha-1 receptors. And alpha-1 receptors are in blood vessels, and they cause vasoconstriction. And we're going to talk more about that later on in the video. So it's pure alpha-1 adrenergic. Adrenergic is essentially catecholamine-based. So this is a catecholamine uh, based vasopressor because it works on catecholamine receptors. This gets into, we divide up vasopressors a little bit into catecholamine or adrenergic. These are kind of synonyms in this case. So adrenergic, catecholamine, catecholaminergic, and non-adrenergic or non-catecholaminergic uh, vasopressors. And the catecholaminergic or adrenergic vasopressors are things like norepinephrine, epinephrine, phenylephrine, um, and all of them work on catecholamine receptors, whereas the non-adrenergic or non-catecholamine vasopressors are things like vasopressin, angiotensin 2, methylene blue, hydroxycobalamin, all things we've talked about in this vasopressor and inotrope series. So phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1, so it works only on alpha-1 receptors. Adrenergic, so it's a catecholamine-based vasopressor. Agonist, so agonist is that it stimulates these alpha-1 receptors. So pure alpha-1 adrenergic agonist used as a vasopressor used to increase blood pressure by inducing peripheral vasoconstriction. Unlike catecholamines such as norepinephrine and epinephrine, phenylephrine has no beta adrenergic activity, right? It's a pure alpha-1. Beta adrenergic activity affects the heart and leads to increase in contractility and increase in heart rate, which can lead to increased cardiac output. Um, and norepinephrine, although small, does have some beta activity, and epinephrine has a fair amount of beta activity. So phenylephrine is pure alpha-1. It has no beta adrenergic activity. So it does not directly affect the heart rate or contractility. Now, directly is really important, and this is something we're going to talk more about because it might actually have some negative indirect effects on heart rate and contractility. So in general, phenylephrine is considered a second or third line agent. This is for things like septic shock. In the operating room, anesthesia tends to use phenylephrine more than um, our job as intensivists uh, in the ICU tend to use it. There are some particular times in which we do grab for it though, which again, we'll talk more about. It's particularly useful when tachycardia or tachyarrhythmias make the beta stimulation undesirable. More to come. Mechanism of action. We dived into a little bit. So this is a pure alpha-1 receptor agonist. So it only works on the alpha-1 receptors. And the alpha-1 receptors are in peripheral blood vessels. That's a blood vessel. There's all these smooth muscle on all these peripheral blood vessels. And the smooth muscle causes, can contract and cause vasoconstriction. So the alpha-1 receptors, when they're stimulated, cause that blood vessel to vasoconstrict. And in doing so, it increases the systemic vascular resistance, which increases the mean arterial blood pressure. So this is a way to increase blood pressure, increase MAP. It does not have any beta-1 or beta-2 activity. So there's no direct effect on heart rate or contractility. But the thing to note here 
is that since it's a pure alpha-1 receptor agonist, it does increase the afterload, so it increases the resistance the heart has to pump against. And this is without at all increasing the contractility. So this sometimes can actually be problematic because this sometimes, especially in patients with cardiac dysfunction, can lead to a decrease in cardiac output indirectly, right? Because it increases the afterload that the heart has to pump against. And by doing so, sometimes that cardiac output will actually drop. So sometimes indirectly, it can decrease the cardiac output, which can uh, be significant and detrimental in some patients. So dosing and administration, the starting dose is typically 0.25 to 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute, with a typical dose range from 0.5 to 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. This is all kind of soft science, right? There's a whole different range in which you can use. At some dose, it probably does not have much effect giving more, but what that dose is is really tough to say. Um, and then central lines preferred, although you can give phenylephrine peripherally through a peripheral IV as long as it's a good dependable peripheral IV. And then most times you're adjusting to maintain a target map of greater than 65. This is particular in vasoplegic shock and septic shock rather than something like cardiogenic shock, which hopefully you're not giving much phenylephrine and cardiogenic shock in general. In the perioperative setting, anesthesia, things like the operating room, um, gives phenylephrine more often than we do in the ICU. Uh, they usually push dose phenylephrine. And you give anywhere from 50 to 200 micrograms IV bolus to temporize the patient. Let's say you're doing procedural sedation and you give that patient propofol and it causes their MAPS to drop. Sometimes you can give kind of a push dose of phenylephrine to try to temporize their blood pressure while the propofol wears off. Um, now this still has to be done carefully, right? There's side effects we're gonna talk about, but this push dose phenylephrine, um, neosinephrine is the brand name, is uh, more often used than the IV continuous infusion version in the ICU. Pharmacokinetics, onset of action is really quick within one to two minutes. Peak effect is within two minutes. The duration though is a little longer. It can last 15 to 20 minutes with a half-life of actually two to three hours. So this sticks around unlike a lot of vasopressors. Phenylephrine sticks around a lot longer. So if they get this IV push of phenylephrine and their blood pressure goes up, as one would anticipate it does, you still gotta be really careful because this phenylephrine still might wear off. And when it wears off, that blood pressure might drop again because you kind of just masked what was going on. Um, and the half-life of phenylephrine can be two to three hours. So it might be a little delayed before that blood pressure drops again. So you just gotta be cognizant of the half-life of these drugs. Um, and phenylephrine sticks around a lot longer than a lot of our vasopressors do otherwise. It is metabolized in the liver. It's excreted in the kidneys. So patients with severe liver dysfunction or renal dysfunction, you got to be a little bit careful uh, because it might stick around even longer than was previously reported uh, in patients who are unable to metabolize it or excrete it. Clinical uses. Phenylephrine is uh, often in ICU can be used in vasodilatory septic shock. Um, if there's tachycardias or arrhythmias limiting other vasopressors, because norepinephrine, oh, that's not a pen, norepinephrine and epinephrine have beta-1 effects, and they can increase the risk for tachydysrhythmias. Now, you know, norepinephrine has very little beta-1 effect, so it's not as common to cause tachydysrhythmias, whereas epinephrine can and does cause tachydysrhythmias. So you got to be a little careful and sometimes, and we personally don't do this very often, um, but you could consider starting phenylephrine to decrease your nor norepinephrine dose to theoretically not lead to as many tachydysrhythmias. Um, but again, the evidence there is very soft. There's not a lot of evidence that bears that out. More common is hypotension during anesthesia, um, commonly used in the OR or post intubation hypotension or procedural sedation hypotension to kind of quote unquote temporize with those IV boluses of 50 to 200 micrograms. Bradycardia and hypotension. Uh, phenylephrine uh, can increase blood pressure, um, sometimes without exacerbating uh, bradycardia, although that's um, not necessarily always true. Uh, I think for the sake of this, we actually might even cross this out. I don't think that's very helpful in retrospect. Okay, um, adult 
uh, adjunct and vasoplegic syndrome. So post-cardiopulmonary bypass or liver transplants, sometimes phenylephrine, again, can temporize the blood pressure. And contrast-induced hypotension. So the summary here is things that are very transient that you expect are just going to last for 20 minutes or so and go away. Sometimes phenylephrine in push dose form, phenylephrine PE, uh, push dose can temporize that patient rather than starting an IV continuous infusion of another vasopressor, but you still got to be very careful with this because that phenylephrine will wear off at some point. Okay, when it comes to vasodilatory shock, sometimes this is a third or fourth line vasopressor realistically rather than a first or second line. The evidence around here, surviving sepsis campaign for septic shock, uh, phenylephrine not recommended a first line because it may reduce cardiac output. Remember we talked about that, it's pure alpha one. So it increases afterload and by increasing afterload, this can sometimes refl reflectively decrease cardiac output, which can be really detrimental in these patients. You may consider it when tachyarrhythmia limits norepinephrine use or st salvage therapy as third or fourth line in refractory septic shock. There have been some trials looking at phenylephrine versus norepinephrine, and phenylephrine uh, often causes lower heart rate and higher systemic vascular resistance. And at times, it actually reduces stroke volume and cardiac output, especially in septic shock. This is exactly what we were talking about up here, right? It can actually decrease cardiac output, which you want all the cardiac output you can get when a patient is in shock. Neurogenic shock uh, is... Often pure alpha-1 can be helpful or sedation-related hypotension, but you could use norepinephrine for all these too. Um, other than the ease of giving a push of phenylephrine, there's not a lot of times um, to use it. One of the caveats to this though would be, oh, did we not put it up here? Oh, shame on us. Um, severe aortic stenosis um, leading to cardiogenic shock. Oddly enough, phenylephrine textbook wise can sometimes be classically first line because in severe aortic stenosis, which this would be a whole video in and of itself, let us know if you want us to put together a, a, a episode on severe aortic stenosis, but you do not circle with a cross through, do not want to increase heart rate or contractility uh, well, all the time in severe aortic stenosis. Sometimes you don't have a choice but to try to increase contractility, but this can be detrimental in severe aortic stenosis because you want as much filling time for the ventricle to try to pump against that gradient. So sometimes phenylephrine is a good first choice in patients with severe aortic stenosis. All right, side effects and complications. Uh, phenylephrine can cause reflex bradycardia, which is why we crossed out that thing above that was talking about heart rate. It can cause reflex barocardia, baroreceptor mediated slowing of heart rate in response to that pure alpha-1 increase in the blood pressure. It can sometimes cause decreased cardiac output uh, by increasing left ventricular afterload, particularly in patients with LV dysfunction. You got to be really, really careful. You should not be grabbing for this drug uh, in patients with left ventricular dysfunction without being very thoughtful about it. Um, it can cause mesenteric and digital ischemia like many of the catecholaminergic vasopressors due to intense vasoconstriction. Um, it can cause hypertension if you don't touch treated appropriately. And if it extravasates into the skin, it can cause tissue necrosis as well um, as many of these catecholaminergic vasopressors can. So if we compare phenylephrine with norepinephrine and vasopressin, um, the receptor profile for phenylephrine is pure alpha-1. So this is pure systemic vascular resistance, whereas norepinephrine is primarily alpha-1 with a little bit of beta-1. And vasopressin is actually non- adrenergic or non-catcholaminergic, and it works on the V1 receptor, which also causes vasoconstriction just through a different mechanism. Cardiac output with phenylephrine either doesn't change or actually goes down. Cardiac output with norepinephrine either doesn't change or goes up, and cardiac output with vasopressin doesn't tend to change. Okay, so you got to be careful with phenylephrine, especially with patients with left ventricular dysfunction. Heart rate, you can get reflex bradycardia and it can decrease the heart rate in phenylephrine. Norepinephrine mildly increases the heart rate through that beta-1 activity and vasopressin is pretty neutral on the heart rate. Arrhythmia risk, very low with phenylephrine because it does not have beta-1 effect. Uh, arrhythmia risk with norepinephrine is mild to moderate because there is a little beta-1 effect and arrhythmia risk of vasopressin is very low, again, because vasopressin does not have the beta-1 effect.
Phenylephrine can be used for hypotension and tachycardia, um, although this is like a stupid statement. Eh, we're going to cross this out too. Um, and then severe aortic stenosis is one of those indications where you can consider phenylephrine, but it's not really first line for anything other than possibly severe AS in certain situations. Norepinephrine is first line for shock, and then vasopressin is usually an adjunct. It's usually second line for septic shock. Clinical summary of phenylephrine. It is a synthetic alpha-1 agonist. Uh, common use is hypotension um, that we think is going to kind of be transient or brief uh, that you can give a bolus of phenylephrine for. The push dose range is 50 to 200 micrograms IV bolus. Onset of action is one to two minutes, although the duration of action is uh, slightly longer. It can last a couple hours. Mean risk is reflex bradycardia. It can cause a decreased cardiac output to give an increase in the afterload and tissue ischemia like many vasopressors. There's no mortality benefit. It's not commonly used in the ICU. It's much more common in the anesthesia world. So teaching pearls, Consider using phenylephrine when you want to raise the blood pressure but avoid stimulating the heart. Um, tachyarrhythmias being one of those things, okay? Uh, be cautious in septic shock with impaired left ventricular dysfunction. Phenylephrine may actually worsen perfusion by increasing afterload and decreasing cardiac output. And in perihypotension or any kind of procedural sedation hypotension, uh, procedural, we spelled it wrong, good for us. Push dose phenylephrine is often used to quick onset um, treat that uh, periprocedural hypotension that can occur. All right, that's all we have for you today. Check out our Patreon page for the study guide and practice questions. Check out our other videos or podcasts, our free newsletter, all that good stuff. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Um, and either way, stay well, keep learning, and we'll certainly see you next time. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on.